good design doesn't happen accidentally. Design is deliberate. Color creates the opportunity for a broad set of variables for the artist or designer to control. Studying color involves science as well as art. Our eye sees reflected light, light that reflects or bounces off objects. Without light, there is no color. Color is light reflected off of objects. Primary colors are those colors that all other colors are made from. The absence of light represents the absence of color. Conversely, light represents the presence of color. White light represents the presence of all colors, and you can see that in this example of the primary colors of light called additive primaries. When I take a green, a red, and a blue circle, and I made this in Photoshop, and these are pure colors of light, and when I add them together, and they overlap, when you add them together, they create white. That's why they're called additive primaries. When you add them together, they create white. Again, these are the primaries of light, red, green, and blue. Photographers use these. Videographers use this set of primaries. Set designers use these primaries, as do electronic media artists. Painters and printmakers and others using pigments use a different set of primaries. We'll talk about those in just a minute. A couple other things that I wanted to point out about these light primaries. So again, we have RGB, red, green, and blue. When I take red and green and overlap them and mix or mix them in equal parts, they give me yellow. When I take red and blue and mix them, they give me magenta, blue, and green combined gives me cyan. Yellow, magenta, and cyan are the subtractive primaries. I'll talk about those in just a minute. I want to provide one other example of how this works. Digital photographs work this way, and this is an example of one of those digital photographs. When you make a color photograph electronically, Essentially what you're doing is taking three black and white pictures all at once, one recording the red layer of information from that scene, one filtering out all of the colors except for the blue information, and another set of filters that filter out all of the information except for the green. You take that red, blue, and green layer and overlap them and project them with light. You get a full color image as you see in the upper left hand corner. The subtractive primaries are called subtractive primaries because when you subtract them, when you pull them away, that's when you get white. Conversely, when you add them together, you get black. These are essentially the primary colors of pigment, although there's some deviation from that as well. And like the additive primaries, when I overlap them, if I take yellow and magenta, Combine them in equal parts, it gives me red. Yellow and cyan gives me green. Cyan and magenta give me blue. The subtractive primary colors and additive primary colors are complementary colors. They are opposite of one another. The term hue simply means color. It's the name of a color. Both scientists and artists have devised systems to organize and label colors. This is an example of the Itten color wheel. Here you can see the primaries of pigments, which have deviated a little bit from the additive and subtractive primaries, where if you're mixing color with paint or ink, these primaries are the colors that you would mix to get all of the other colors. So what you can see in these primaries, yellow, blue, and red. When I mix yellow and blue, they give me green. When I mix yellow and red, that gives me orange. When I mix red and blue, that gives me violet. And then I can have tertiary colors in between that are essentially between those different 
primary or secondary colors. Another example of the in color wheel. So again, you can see the primary colors in the center. As you mix primary colors, you get a secondary color. As you mix secondary colors with a primary color, you get what's called a tertiary color. Color wheels can be extremely valuable for the artist when you're inventing color for your piece. There's a variety of color wheels out there and I'm going to suggest that you either build or purchase one. Here's another color wheel, the Munsell color wheel. And you can see that with intensity of color here. The Munsell color wheel in this case combines color with value. Value is the amount of light or dark in an image. So as you see towards the center, we have lighter colors and as we move out towards the edge, they darken. Essentially, we're adding black to those colors as they darken, or white to those colors as they lighten. And indeed, you can get these three-dimensional color wheels. Well, another important aspect about color is what's called color temperature. And this is really more of a scientific approach to color. But color temperature refers to both a physical temperature, called the Kelvin scale, as well as the psychological impact of the color. Color temperature is important in creating the illusion of space. The Kelvin scale is a color temperature scale that's represented by actual physical temperatures. To arrive at these temperatures, essentially what they do is they take a black piece of metal and heat that metal so hot until it starts to turn color. It first turns red, gets a little hotter, starts going to orange, to yellow, it gets white hot, and eventually it will get blue hot. Well, as they measure those temperatures of the different colors, the physical temperature, that now becomes the Kelvin scale for color temperature. This is particularly important for electronic artists, for interior architects who are going to need to know something about the color of light in their interiors, as well as photographers. Light is color. And knowing something about the difference in those colors will aid every artist. So in this example, I've given you some practical examples of Kelvin temperature. You can see as we look at the average daylight, for example, it's about 5,600 degrees Kelvin. Early morning or late afternoon when the sun is closer to the horizon and it gets filtered through the Earth's atmosphere a bit more, it usually warms up the color. Something about 42, 4,400 Kelvin is pretty normal for late afternoon or early morning light. Working inside with incandescent lights. You might be working with colors that are about 2800 degrees Kelvin. For a photographer, you need to know something about the quality of light that you're photographing in to determine how to display that color. For photographers shooting in RAW, you can figure that out after you've made the picture. If your camera does not allow you to shoot in RAW, then one of the things that you need to do is assess the quality of light that you're photographing in and match the white balance of the camera with the color temperature of the scene that you're photographing. For example, if I was to use a daylight white balance and bring it inside and photograph in an incandescent room, all of my colors are going to be yellow because I'm not matching the white balance of the scene with the interpretation of that white balance in your camera. Again, if you're able to shoot in RAW, R-A-W, that gives you the unprocessed color information that the camera records, and you can change the color temperature after you make the picture rather than before. If you're not shooting in RAW, you really need to adjust white balance to match the source that you're photographing. Here you can see the photographer, if they're wanting to create more or less neutral color. You can see for the lighting that you, they're using, it's about 5,000 degrees Kelvin. If I shot at a lower or higher temperature, you're going to see that my 
color changes. Our eye sees in relative light. We see color in relation to other colors. By that, I mean if I take a blue rectangle and I shine a yellow light on it, it's still going to look blue to the human eye because our eye or brain kind of filters out the yellow light and shows us the color. Camera doesn't work that way. A camera actually would record true color rather than relative color. So if I took a camera image of something blue, shined a yellow light on it, blue and yellow combine create green. In that camera image, it's going to look green. Generally speaking, warm colors protrude. They advance visually. They become positive spaces. Cool colors recede. They are generally negative space. Warm colors, by that I mean yellows, reds, oranges, cool colors, greens, and blues. Most images combine warm and cold colors. Value is the relative lightness or darkness of a color. It is essentially the amount of light or dark in a color, the amount of white or black in a color. Here you can see a value scale on the bottom, very dark colors at the top, very light with specific increments in between that you can see the changes of, in value going from dark to light or light to dark can also change our attention. My suggestion is some of the lightest and most intense colors here attract our attention more quickly and more directly than the dark colors. Again, that's positive and negative space. Some examples of that in practice in this Edward Hoppner painting, Nighthawks. You can see his use of all these darker values, not only to display the sense of nighttime, but perhaps of aloneness, of solitude, even loneliness. And you can see the one area that's lit inside the diner there with this lighter, warm color but that provides a wash on the other people, but otherwise they're in this sort of dark mystery in a way. Another excellent example of the use of value in this Alex Katz painting. You can see the person that he's painted in a darkened space wearing a dark coat, but that bright yellow hair in the intensity of the tone of, and color of the flesh attracts our attention. Intensity describes the purity of a color. It's a word that's synonymous with saturation or chroma. Pure color or paint straight out of the tube has the highest intensity. Intensity diminishes as it is mixed or as it is diluted with another color. High intensity colors maximize impact. You can see that in this Roy Lichtenstein painting with the word pop in an intense color popping off the canvas in some ways. But the other colors here are almost equally intense, the oranges, the reds, and even the blue. All of that provides a certain visual power as this explosion of color that we see in this canvas. Or Andy Warhol's portrait of Marilyn Monroe, where he uses a variety of intense colors. They're absurd color combinations at the same time. But it's the intensity of the color, the brightness of the color, that adds vibrancy to this piece. And certainly the use of the grid is amplified by the use of the intense colors that punctuate our visual dialogue with this piece. West Coast painter Joan Brown often used intense colors. You can see that in her portrait, the Bicentennial Champion. The intense reds and blues and even yellows demand our attention. Or this Barbara Caston photograph, where she's setting things up in her studio and then using cut pieces of mirror to reflect colors and light, which we don't otherwise see in the photograph. These are kind of beautiful compositions. They are eye candy in a way, 
but she really utilizes the intensity of the colors here to attract our attention and create our visual interest. That doesn't mean that color has to be intense. Low intensity colors can work as well. Low intensity colors create maybe more mute or quiet imagery, even if the subject matter denies that. You can see that in this Kiki Smith etching, Wolf Girl from 1999. The subject matter itself is kind of intense, but the color, if anything, is more subtle and low key. It, in some ways, downplays the intensity of the subject matter. Or Robert and Shauna Parkey Harrison, who create these images with camera in studio and then manipulate them in Photoshop. You can see as the character here is sort of standing at the edge of the world with an ax. Is he going to cut down that tree? Or is he going to slice off the little piece of land that he's actually standing on? We see the clouds of the heavens in the background subtly colored as you see co subtle coloration on the ground and even the figure itself. It's understating the piece because the piece itself is pretty vibrant. And so intensifying the colors just might be too much. Sometimes less is more. Most images mix intensity, have some colors that are intense and others less so.